may have lost his life, but he's gonna give life to a hell of a lot of kids. His death will not be in vain. Shows that Jeremiah was in that kennel, and that's likely where he took his final breath. Yeah, my getting mad at Jeremiah, and so he put him in the dog cage in the living room. They also called Pena a drug addict, which her mother says in part led to her grandson's death. Today's case is one that I know is going to stick with you for a very long time, if not for the rest of your life. On this channel, we shed light on some of the most sick, twisted, and brutal things human beings are capable of, but truly, words can't come close to describing how horrific this case is. This child suffered so much pain and torment at the hands of people who were supposed to protect him. It's heartbreaking, sickening, and again, just as a warning, this case will absolutely infuriate you. But with that being said, let's just jump right into the details of this case. Jeremiah Valencia was born on December 6, 2003 to Tracy Ann Pena and Andrew Valencia, and he was living in Nambe, New Mexico, which is just north of Santa Fe. From the time Jeremiah was born, he had a rough life. Both his mother and father were in and out of jail for various reasons, with his father being sent to prison when Jeremiah was just six years old. That was the last time Andrew saw his son. For the years that followed, Jeremiah and his younger sister lived on and off with their mother. There was one time in which Jeremiah and his sister were removed from the home and placed into the care of their grandparents while DCFS investigated Tracy. However, they were ultimately placed back into her care. Eventually, Tracy's boyfriend, 42-year-old Thomas Ferguson, as well as Thomas's son, 19-year-old Jordan Nunez, moved in with the family. Jeremiah was described by loved ones as fearless, active, and outgoing. He was definitely a handful full of energy. He made the most of every day. He was known to be really sweet and helpful and not shy around anybody. He would walk up to just about anyone and introduce himself, making friends very easily. He loved Batman, cars, sports, getting messy, and building things. He was an intelligent kid with a bright future ahead of him. But unfortunately, everything that Jeremiah was looking forward to in life would be brutally and violently ripped away from him by the very people who were supposed to care for him and protect him. Jeremiah never stood a chance. And when you find out what happened to this poor, sweet 13-year-old boy, you will be absolutely disgusted. This case starts in January of 2018. At the time, both 35-year-old Tracy and her boyfriend, then 42-year-old Thomas, were in jail after violating their probation. Thomas's probation was from a past case back in 2014, where he had pleaded guilty to kidnapping and battery of a family member. Already, we're seeing the type of person Thomas was. Meanwhile, Tracy had been on probation after pleading guilty in August of 2018 to charges of concealing evidence in relation to drug possession. While in jail, Tracy confided in another inmate about a secret she had been keeping. A very dark, disturbing secret. What Tracy told this inmate was shocking, so she brought this information to a prison guard. This inmate told the guard that Tracy said that back in November of 2017, she came home to find her son dead and was blaming her boyfriend for his death. She said that her boyfriend forced her to help dispose of his body and keep his death a secret. Those are the main details Tracy gave this inmate, but of course, this inmate was disturbed to say the least. The guard then took this statement to other prison officials who started an investigation into the claims. Of course, rumors like this can run rampant around jails, people confessing to random things they didn't do, sometimes to cop a deal or sometimes to make themselves look tougher to the other inmates. Sometimes people will make things up and put the blame on someone else who they have beef with to make them look bad. But still, these claims were worth looking into because this was a very serious situation if it were true. First, prison staff did confirm that Tracy did have a son as well as a younger daughter. From there, staff started listening in on Tracy's prison phone calls and they heard one call that piqued their interest. 
They heard Tracy on the phone with her boyfriend, Thomas, saying that she was crying about something that happened. She wasn't specific with it, but she was clearly distraught when speaking with Thomas, and he was trying to sort of calm the situation down and making it not seem like a big deal, but Tracy obviously thought that whatever was going on was a pretty big deal. After this call, investigators took Tracy in for an interview where they asked her about her son. At first, she said that Jeremiah had run away from the home and she didn't know where he was. That is what she was upset about. But after some pushing from investigators, Tracy gave them more information about what was really going on. Tracy told them that back in November of 2017, she was getting out of jail for a previous charge. When she returned home, she found that Jeremiah was dead. She found him lying on his bed, unresponsive, wrapped up in a blanket. She confronted Thomas about this, asking her what happened to her son. She mentioned that Thomas had abused Jeremiah in the past, so she knew that Thomas was probably the one responsible for this. But according to Tracy, Thomas forced her to help him put Jeremiah's body into a plastic storage container, which they then placed into Thomas's car. From there, Thomas drove with Tracy and his younger son along New Mexico 503, where they stopped and picked an isolated area in Nambe where they wouldn't be seen. There, they buried that container in a shallow grave before driving off. For the weeks that followed, nobody noticed Jeremiah's disappearance. He hadn't been enrolled in school at the time, so there was no one at any school to notice his absence. Anytime family members or friends would reach out to the family or ask about Jeremiah, Tracy and Thomas just made themselves impossible to reach. Either that, or they always had their excuses. Thomas's younger sister was told to tell others that Jeremiah was staying with other family members. There was basically an entire plan in place to cover for Jeremiah's murder. In that interview, Tracy told investigators that she didn't report what happened because she was scared of Thomas. He was abusive. He had been abusing her and her children for years, and now she truly knew what he was capable of. If she said anything, he was going to hurt or even kill her too. After making this startling confession, Tracy took investigators to the area where Jeremiah's body was dumped. Tracy didn't remember the exact location of where he was buried, so investigators brought out cadaver dogs to aid in the search. Pretty quickly, investigators found a spot in the ground just off the highway which looked recently disturbed. It was clear that the ground had been dug up and the area had been covered with tree branches and other debris. Investigators uncovered the area and began digging, and there they discovered a relatively small plastic container. When they opened up that container, they found that 13-year-old Jeremiah Valencia's body had been crammed inside. Upon examining his body at the scene, they found that he was wearing a diaper at the time of his death, again, despite the fact that he was a teenager. His body also showed clear signs of being abused. Although there was no blood present on his body, it was obvious that Jeremiah Valencia had been brutally beaten and tortured before his tragic death. Immediately after the discovery of little Jeremiah's body, both Tracy and Thomas were charged with child abuse resulting in death, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to tamper with evidence. Then, Thomas's adult son, Jordan, was also charged in connection with Jeremiah's death. They said that since Jordan was an adult at the time, he could have reported the abuse or at least done something to try and stop it, but he did nothing. And I also want to mention that he went with Thomas to help dispose of Jeremiah's body. At this time, investigators knew that Jeremiah had been abused to death. However, as the investigation continued, the devastating truth of just how much Jeremiah suffered before his death was uncovered. And let me tell you, it's so, so much worse than you could ever imagine. First, after Jeremiah's body was found, he was sent off to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. There, they found numerous old and new injuries, which indicated that Jeremiah had suffered physical abuse and torture for months before he was beaten one final time, resulting in his death. Some of the injuries Jeremiah suffered included multiple jaw fractures, one of which was so bad that the bone was protruding through his gums. 
The fracture was likely sustained on the day he was killed. He had suffered multiple broken ribs and multiple bone fractures in his hand. He had a displaced eyeball as well as tears and abrasions to his scalp, cheek, and ear. According to the medical examiner, there were injuries consistent with a sexual assault as well, though that couldn't be definitively stated. They also stated that there were parts of his body that appeared to have been burned. Then, according to the toxicology report, Jeremiah had both alcohol and meth in his system, so he was most likely forced to consume these substances. I will note that the state of decomposition he was in by that point made the autopsy difficult, so there were some answers that they couldn't give definitively. We don't know for sure if he was truly sexually assaulted. We also don't know if he was actually burned, but it does appear that way, though again, we don't know 100%. Jeremiah's cause of death was determined to be the result of blunt force trauma, and his manner of death was homicide. As the autopsy was being conducted, of course, detectives also started their investigation into what was really going on within that home. First, they looked into Thomas Ferguson's background, and what they found was disturbing, yet I must say, not all that surprising given what we know now. Turns out, Thomas Ferguson had a long history of criminal behavior, starting back in 1997 when he was convicted for possession of methamphetamine. After that, he has numerous other offenses relating to domestic violence and abuse towards animals. In 2003, he was convicted of beating his then-wife. In this case, it was stated that Thomas punched, choked, and kicked his wife while she was holding their eight-month-old daughter. Now, turns out Thomas was married to a woman named Amanda Nunez for 16 years. Amanda had married Thomas when she was just 14 years old, and for the following almost two decades, she suffered constant abuse. Amanda would later say that Thomas never even treated her like a person. She was an obsession for him, this object that he liked to beat up on. Throughout their relationship, Amanda suffered from three miscarriages because of how badly Thomas would beat her. There were also several times where he would beat her within inches of her life. Amanda did end up having five children with Thomas, one of which was a son named Julian. But even after having all those children, the abuse just continued to get worse. When Julian was only two months old, Thomas was convinced that he was not the father, so he punched this baby in the chest in a fit of rage. He would always tell Amanda that he wished this little son of a bitch would die. After those 16 long years, Amanda finally took her children and ran. At that time, Amanda changed Julian's name to Jordan so that Thomas wouldn't be able to find him. For a time after Amanda moved, she would have a police officer go to the home with her every night to check under the beds and in the closets before she went in to make sure Thomas wasn't there. For the years that followed, Jordan and his siblings would be moved around to different homes. When he was a teenager, he ultimately did end up living with his grandparents. By the time he was 18, though, Jordan actually left his grandparents' home and reconnected with his father. More on this aspect of the case later in the video. Now, after the relationship with his wife was over by 2014, Thomas moved his rage and violence onto other victims. As I alluded to earlier, he was convicted of kidnapping and battery after he held his girlfriend captive for four days. However, despite these convictions, Thomas always found a way to weasel his way out of jail and back into society, where he had this cunning ability to pick up women. According to the sister of the victim I mentioned from his 2014 conviction, Thomas was very charming and had this ability to identify and prey on the most vulnerable women. The sister said that her sister was vulnerable when she met Thomas because she had a history of domestic abuse and she had five children. The two were together for four or five years, and of course, their relationship was riddled with domestic violence. He would often beat her and physically abuse her. Thankfully, in her situation, the children were typically with their fathers, so they weren't abused like she was. 
but Thomas would often abuse their animals, with the woman frequently having to take her pets to the vet for things like broken legs and other injuries, which is just horrible to even picture. Then on Valentine's Day in 2014, Thomas took the woman to a home which he had prepared with bars on the doors and windows. This is where he held her captive for four days. Eventually, she was able to escape and ran to a nearby Walmart where family picked her up. It was clear when they picked her up that she had been strangled and severely beaten, but the woman was too afraid to tell her family the real details of what happened. After this incident, he was charged with kidnapping and rape, but the woman was too afraid of Thomas to go to trial and testify against him, so she agreed to Thomas taking a plea deal of lesser charges of kidnapping and battery. For this, he was sentenced to nine years, with seven years and seven months suspended. If he messed up at all during his probation, he would return to jail for the full nine years. This was a ridiculously light sentence for someone who literally kidnapped and beat someone, if those are the charges that he pled guilty to. I don't know how he only spent a year and a half in jail for this, but... I digress. While he and this victim dated, the sister of the victim said that those two never got along because she was a strong woman with a big personality and he hated her for that, being the sister, not the victim. Instead, he would always choose women who weren't in the best places in their lives, women with criminal backgrounds, who used drugs and had children. He found that these women were easy to manipulate and control, and if they didn't comply with what he wanted, he could use their children as leverage, hold them over their heads to get what he wanted. And according to Tracy Pena, that is exactly how it was in her relationship with Thomas. He abused her and controlled her. Eventually, he and his son, Jordan, moved in with Tracy and her children, and while there, he abused the children within the home. Despite the fact that Tracy was aware of this, she was too afraid to do anything. However, there would be some information uncovered that led investigators to believe that neither Tracy or Jordan are as much of victims in this case as they'd like you to think. Now, as officers continued their investigation, they spoke with Jeremiah's younger sister, who was 12 years old at the time, and what she had to say was disturbing. She said that living with Thomas was miserable. He was always angry, always taking it out on everyone in the home. He would hit Tracy, her, Jeremiah, and the dogs. But it seemed that Jeremiah got the worst of it. For basically the entire time that Thomas lived with them, he would physically punish Jeremiah. This started with having him stand in the fireplace or stand up in a locked closet for hours at a time so that Thomas could always keep an eye on him, always knew exactly where he was and what he was doing. At one point, Thomas removed every single item from Jeremiah's room and then forced him to stay in that room for prolonged periods of time. But then, around Halloween time, the abuse and torture escalated drastically. Every single day for an entire month, Thomas would beat Jeremiah in one way or another. Thomas would beat Jeremiah with brass knuckles. He would use Jeremiah as target practice for his homemade spear, throwing it at him and poking and stabbing him with it. Then he would drop a five pound sledgehammer on his hands, hence all of those broken bones in his hand. He also forced Jeremiah to wear a shock collar. According to his sister, Jeremiah constantly had to wear the shock collar either around his neck or legs, and everyone within that home would take turns using the remote to shock him. Then, Thomas started locking Jeremiah in a small plastic dog crate, leaving him in there for hours upon hours at a time, leaving him without food or water. He was also forced to wear adult diapers because he wasn't let out to use the bathroom either. While in there, the men in the home would sometimes urinate on him just to torture him further. Thomas had also installed bars on the windows and padlocked the doors to prevent anyone from leaving. He also put up security cameras all around the place so he could constantly watch what was going on in that home. It got to the point that by November of 2017, Jeremiah was so malnourished, so weak from being immobilized for so long that he could barely walk. He hobbled around using a cane, hardly even being able to stand up straight. Again, 
despite the fact that he was a 13-year-old little boy. By November 26th, Jeremiah's sister explained that they were all about to leave the home to go pick up Tracy from jail. But then, Thomas got angry at Jeremiah for whatever reason and locked him in that dog cage. There, Jeremiah eventually fell asleep, but then Thomas started flipping the dog cage and tossing it all around, trying to wake Jeremiah up. Eventually, Thomas pulled him out of the dog cage and gave Jeremiah a beating. By the end of the beating, it appeared to the sister that Jeremiah was unconscious, and at that point, Jeremiah was in horrible condition. He had a black eye. The cuts on his body were all infected and nasty. He had a tooth knocked out after being punched in the face. It's thought that this beating is what caused his jaw to break so bad that the bone protruded through his gums. But by that point, Jeremiah was still alive. After the beating and shaking around the dog cage, Jeremiah was put back inside the crate. By that point, according to Jeremiah's sister, Jordan joined in and started flipping the dog crate and rattling it around. It was after the dog crate was flipped by Jordan that Jeremiah actually died from his injuries. That is what sent him over the edge. After realizing that Jeremiah was dead, he and his father took Jeremiah's body to the tub and washed him before putting him into the bed. According to investigators, there was no blood on Jeremiah due to him being washed after the beating. However, there was a small amount of blood near the door in Jeremiah's bedroom, as well as around the fireplace of the home. This is probably where the majority of the beatings took place. He was always angry and he was always being mean. My yeah, mom was getting mad at Jeremiah and so he put him in the dog cage in the living room. And he was really skinny and he had, um, he, all his cups were infected. He started to flip the cage and he told him to sleep him alone and he didn't. And then he pulled him out and um, he's, his head is just kind of So as of right now, according to Jeremiah's sister, not only did Jordan take part in the abuse, but him flipping the crate over is what caused Jeremiah's death. To go even further, as a part of the investigation, detectives also took a look into the digital forensics from Thomas's and Jordan's devices. Specifically, they found two Facebook accounts registered to Jordan, another two registered to Thomas, and then one registered to Tracy. By January 7th, investigators found messages from Thomas to Jordan that talk about how Jordan doesn't respect Thomas and makes reference to Jeremiah being gone. Now, I do want to note that these messages are written with a lot of typos and are pretty difficult to read, so bear with me. In one message, Thomas wrote, Jordan, the troublemaker's gone. You got rid of his expletive and now you're starting to get like him. And you have started lying to me, son, about things that you have been doing and done. Jordan replied, I do respect you. I'm just unwanted here and that's cool. But I can see in yours and Tracy's and my sister's eyes, you all don't want me here ever since that expletive happened. They look at me like I did it all by myself. They did it too. He continued, I miss that expletive too. I feel bad for what I did. And if I could do things differently, I would have, but I can't. I have nightmares. Nightmares. I think about that kid every day because I looked in his eyes as he left. I see that look every day. Of course, it can be gathered from these messages that Jordan is in fact the one who took Jeremiah's life. Thomas bears most of the responsibility for beating him within inches of his life and the rest of the family do bear responsibility for how poorly they treated him. But Jordan was technically the one who ended Jeremiah's life. After finding out this information, Jordan was charged with child abuse resulting in death. So now, all three individuals who played a role in Jeremiah's appalling and disturbing death have been charged. As they awaited their respective trials in jail, they all continued to deny responsibility, each pointing the finger at the next person. Tracy couldn't do anything because she was abused by Thomas and was scared of him. Thomas was straight up denying abusing Jeremiah, saying that he died after they innocently roughhoused. Jordan also denied ever doing anything to Jeremiah. Despite this, each individual was scheduled to get their time in courts to decide what really happened to this sweet, innocent little boy. 
That was until Thomas took that opportunity away in his one final act of selfishness. By the evening of April 30th, 2018, a guard was making his round in the Santa Fe County Jail when he made it to Thomas's cell. There, he found Thomas Ferguson dead after he hung himself from the cell's window. After finding Thomas's body, the guard found an envelope lying on a small desk in that cell. In that envelope, there was a letter which Thomas had apparently written to profess his innocence. The letter has not been released to the public, but I can only imagine that he probably spewed the most pathetic BS imaginable. And instead of just taking accountability for his role in torturing an innocent child, he took the coward's way out and took his own life before he had to face responsibility for what he did. The horrific details surrounding the death of 13-year-old Jeremiah Valencia rocked the area and the state. Now the man accused in his murder avoided being held responsible, according to the DA. Back in January, 13-year-old Jeremiah Valencia's body was found in a shallow grave in Santa Fe County. Shocking details emerged about the boys' murders, with investigators saying they believe Jeremiah endured horrendous abuse at the hands of Ferguson, his mother's boyfriend. Ferguson's son, Jordan Nunez, told investigators he saw Ferguson beat Jeremiah with brass knuckles, a cane, a homemade spear, and a five-pound hammer. Jeremiah was also forced to wear a diaper while locked up in a dog kennel for hours on end. Additional evidence suggests Valencia was sexually assaulted and possibly burned. You never want to see a child uh, go through what Jeremiah went through. Now Ferguson is dead after committing suicide at the Santa Fe County Detention Center. According to the local DA's office, Ferguson was alone in a segregated unit with increased patrol. DA Marco Cerna would not comment on if Ferguson had ever been placed on suicide watch. I'm angry that this happened because I don't believe that uh, Ferguson uh, is going to receive the full justice that my office was going to bring uh, against him to bring justice to Jeremiah. My office is going to vigor vigorously prosecute uh, Ms. Pena and, and Mr. Nunez, who we have, we have indicted, they are in custody, uh, so we're going to focus our attention on them. Um, I wish we could have brought that justice to Jeremiah and his family. Uh, by convicting uh, Ferguson. After this, the prosecution in this case really started gearing up for the trials against Tracy and Jordan. It was said by Jordan's defense that the only reason prosecutors started pinning the murder on Jordan was because Thomas was now dead. But as we heard from earlier, there is evidence to prove that he did kill Jeremiah. There was a witness, plus those messages make it pretty obvious what happened. So now going into what happened with each defendant in their respective cases. By November of 2018, Tracy actually worked with prosecutors to come to a plea agreement. 36-year-old Tracy Pena pleaded guilty to one count of child abuse resulting in death and three counts of conspiracy to traffic controlled substances. She had been facing around 13 other charges at the time, but they were all dropped in exchange for her guilty plea. When it came for her sentencing, the prosecution argued that Tracy could have done so much more than she did to stop Jeremiah's death. She had ample opportunity to remove her children from that abusive household, but she didn't. According to Tracy's sister, Tracy was a drug addict who seemed to care more about getting her drugs than protecting her kids. There were plenty of times where Tracy would escape the home and escape Thomas's abuse, but she would leave the kids behind knowing what Thomas would do to them. There were times where she would stay locked in her room for days at a time doing drugs, not caring to protect them or remove them from Thomas's abuse. This aunt said that she always told Tracy that the kids could stay with her whenever they needed, but Tracy wouldn't allow that. She knew what was happening to her son and she allowed it to happen. Yes, she may have been scared, but she had plenty of opportunities to get help and never bothered to. Therefore, she is responsible for the abuse, torture, and death of her son, 13-year-old Jeremiah. And again, the defense was basically claiming that Tracy was under Thomas's thumb. She was being horrifically abused and was so scared that she felt she couldn't do anything to save Jeremiah. She could have been killed if she tried doing anything. After hearing from multiple witnesses and hearing arguments on both sides, the judge came to their decision for Tracy's sentence. 
they did acknowledge that Tracy was not an active participant in Jeremiah's abuse. She never laid a hand on him. She just allowed the abuse and torture to happen. They also talked about how Jeremiah's body was found with Tracy's help. She did eventually tell investigators what happened, and without her confession, who knows how long it would have taken to even realize that Jeremiah was missing. They also acknowledged that she was abused. She was also a victim. However, that didn't mean she couldn't do anything. If she truly wanted out of the situation, if she truly cared enough about her kids, she would have done so much more to protect them. With all factors considered, at the end of this, Tracy was sentenced to 12 years in prison for her role in Jeremiah's death. 13-year-old Jeremiah Valencia was beaten, left in a dog crate, forced to wear diapers, and ultimately killed, allegedly, by Tomas Ferguson and his son, Jordan Nunez, last year in Nambe. In court today, prosecutors say Ferguson kept his girlfriend, Tracy Pena, drugged up, locked up, and under video surveillance. They also called Pena a drug addict, which her mother says, in part, led to her grandson's death. District Attorney Marco Cerna pointed out Pena led them to Jeremiah's body in this shallow grave off a road near Nambe, but he says because she did not speak up, her son was murdered. And we did have a, a, a you know, a mother who uh, uh, said that she was guilty of, of causing the child's death by her inaction, because uh, that's essentially what happened. She was uh, present and didn't do anything about it. Now, on to what happened with Jordan Nunez. By late 2020, Jordan also pleaded guilty to one count of permitting child abuse resulting in death and two counts of tampering with evidence. The prosecution stated that Jordan was an active participant in the torture and abuse of Jeremiah. He witnessed Thomas beating Jeremiah and keeping him in that dog crate, yet did nothing to help him. Then, on the day of the murder, he witnessed Thomas beating Jeremiah within inches of his life, yet he didn't do anything. Not only that, but he joined in and landed the final blow to this terrified, helpless child. For the weeks leading to Jordan's sentencing hearing, there was a lot of different discussions regarding his mental health. He was abused from the time he was an infant. He had suffered similar physical abuse as Jeremiah did at the hands of the same man. However, he was removed from the home and went off to live with his grandparents who loved him and raised him in a stable home. Yet, once he was 18, he left that loving home and returned to the same father who abused him as a child. Why? We really don't know. Jordan chose to live in that home with his father and continued to make that choice even after seeing how people were being treated in that home. Jordan said that while in the home, everyone was terrified of Thomas, which I don't disagree with. He said that he suffered from PTSD from his past abuse and would often get flashbacks from when he was a child. He said that he was way too scared of his father to ever stand up to him, so that is why he never did anything. But again, we don't know why he made the decision to leave his grandparents' home and move in with his father. Again, he made that choice. He went out of his way to make that choice. When it comes to the day of Jeremiah's death, the defense was basically saying that yes, shaking and flipping the dog crate was unbelievably cruel and reckless, but Jordan never meant to hurt or kill Jeremiah. I don't know what he was trying to do if he wasn't trying to hurt him, but I guess he wasn't trying to hurt him. Again, even though Jordan knew that Jeremiah was just beaten within inches of his life, it obviously doesn't make any sense. Either way, at the end of Jordan's sentencing hearing, the judge decided that Jordan did play a massive role in Jeremiah's death. He had access to phones, social media, and was able to leave the house, yet he did nothing to help. And again, he did partake in the abuse. At the end, Jordan was sentenced to 21 years behind bars for his part in the death of 13-year-old Jeremiah Valencia. At the end of the hearing, Jordan did face the court to apologize. He said that he doesn't know why he never called 911, but now he wishes he did. However, family members did not think that he was being genuine. They believe that he is more upset that he was caught and is having to take responsibility, not that he's sorry for how he treated this child. Uh, how do you plead to count one abuse of a child resulting in death? Guilty. 
Nunez also pled guilty to counts two and three, both tampering with evidence. Jeremiah's body was found in a shallow grave outside a highway in Nambe three years ago. Investigators say there was evidence the boy was locked in a dog cage, beaten, and starved. Jeremiah's mother, Tracy Pena, her boyfriend, jo uh, Thomas Ferguson, and his son, Jordan Nunez, were all arrested in connection with the murder. Ferguson killed himself shortly after he was arrested. Today in court, prosecutors gave a look at what happened leading up to the moments before Jeremiah's death. Jordan says he rattled the cage. A.V. says he flipped it. But regardless, their own statements that is also corroborated by the DNA evidence shows that Jeremiah was in that kennel and that's likely where he took his final breath. But at this point, that is all of the information we have on today's case. I know I say this a lot, but this has got to be one of the worst cases I have ever covered. It's not just the fact that Jeremiah was abused so horrifically, but the fact that so many people knew, so many people saw, yet nobody did anything. I think it's just crazy that he wasn't enrolled in school and nobody bothered to follow up or check on him. I don't know how a kid can just slip through the cracks like that without anyone ever checking. It's really disheartening to know that people like this can get away with abusing children for so, so long and nothing will be done. And it's true. The real reason why Jeremiah's case was even investigated was because of Tracy. Not that it makes anything better with how she allowed this to happen, but I'm glad she at least said something. And knowing that, knowing that if she didn't say anything, that this case might still not even have been investigated, nobody might have even known that Jeremiah was missing, that's so, so, so disturbing. Now, the main person responsible for inflicting so much terror and so much pain on so many people is gone, and I'm not mad about it. The two people are still living behind bars right where they belong. Now, I do think both individuals should have gotten much longer sentences. I don't know what it is with, I guess, New Mexico and giving these people ridiculously short sentences. That's absolutely ridiculous. They should have gotten a lot more time, especially, honestly, both of them. I won't even say especially either of them because Tracy allowed this to happen and Jordan partook in it. Both of them should be in jail for the rest of their lives. But at the end of the day, I guess... They are still behind bars. They're paying for what they did. And I certainly hope that every single person in those prisons knows exactly what both of them did. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to hear from you guys. Do you think Tracy truly was too scared to do anything about the abuse? Or was she just too wrapped up in drugs to care? Do you think Jordan was also too scared? Or was he a fully willing participant? What do you think of him technically causing Jeremiah's death? Do you think he bears that responsibility? Or is it Thomas's fault due to the beating? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.